So how many of you have done any work looking at the different generations of, of folks that are in the workforce now? Baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y. How many of you have been talking about it in your classes? Oops, sorry. Have been talking about it in your classes? Reading about it? Okay, some of you, good. So I don't want to offend anybody. These are not generalizations. These are basically things that are you finding in the literature. So we're not making any of this stuff up. But the reason we want to look at these things is that our culture is multi-generational. When you go working in a hospital or a healthcare organization or anywhere for that matter, you're going to find all these folks working there. And you better figure out how to get along with everyone. And the easiest way to get along with people is to understand what their background is and why they are the way they are, why they think the way they do, and why they do the things the way they do them. So to understand the generations, it helps us to embrace whether we're leaders, it helps us to embrace our employees, it helps us to embrace our colleagues, and it engages your staff. So as a leader, you want to understand all the people that are working around you, because in healthcare, if you have an engaged uh, workforce, what are you going to get? You're going to get good outcomes and have better patient experience. That is a proven correlation. So more engaged staff, happy patients. Happy staff, happy patients. Can't make people happy on a staff if we don't understand them. So the first generation we're going to look at are the baby boomers. These are the folks that were born between 1946 and 1964. They tend to be very loyal. They are very experienced. Um, they have a strong work ethic. Um, their parents were generally people who had been in World War II or products of World War II, and that's why they were baby boomers, because after everyone came back from war, everybody started having babies. <laughs> um, in general, baby boomers like face-to-face -face communication. So if you go to my hospital, my campus is a little different than the rest of the campuses. Most of our um, employees are baby boomers, and they love face-to-face -face communication. They don't like a lot of email. They don't like electronic communications as much. Because they have a strong work ethic, they're really good at following the rules. And they often don't like to change the rules. They don't like to be that innovative um, when it comes to the work ethic. They're embarrassed by too much praise. I have an employee who's been there for 40, uh, excuse me, she'll be 50, it'll be 50 years um, in December. She'll be there 50 years. She's a third generation employee. And when I've said to her, oh my god, three generations? That must be phenomenal. She's like, I'm not the only one. There's a whole bunch of us third generation at this campus. And, and she's the kind of person that doesn't like a lot of recognition. Why? Because they feel like a good day's work is what I'm supposed to do. So you don't need to give me thanks and praise for doing what I'm supposed to do. That's the mindset. As we go through the different generations, start thinking about how they're different and also think about how they're similar. They tend to struggle with technology. I find this one kind of interesting. But yet, during their generation, we had color TV, they had microwaves, they had things that made their lives more convenient. Yet, they don't embrace technology now. So, can't figure that one out. Generation X. So, I'm a Gen Xer. They were born between 1965 and 1979. We were considered ignored and misunderstood. Um, we grew up in the age of home computing. I, I was thinking about that when I put the slide together. I said, oh my God. My first computer was a Commodore 64. I begged my parents for this computer. You hooked it up to the TV. And I think I was about 10 or 12. And all I could do was do one program that made a balloon. That's all I did. <laughs> but I had an Atari 2600 and I played games forever. Um, many of us in that generation, many were latchkey kids. Um, does anybody know what a latchkey kid is? Oh my God, I'm so old. So latchkey children, latchkey children. See, I, I don't take for granted that people, people know. So a latchkey child is someone who, because both their parents work, or maybe they are from a single parent home, there's no one home when they come home from school. So they wear a key around their neck, they know how to get inside, they know how to lock themselves inside, and they stay there and they do their homework until their parent or parents come home from school. Those are latchkey kids. So you have to understand that in the, the late 60s and early 70s, people actually started getting divorced. Um, that was not really heard of as much before. So now you had more single family homes and you had latchkey kids. Why is that important? Because latchkey children tend to be more independent. They had to learn how to cook. <laughs> they had to learn how to take care of themselves. And because of that independence, when it skipped down, it makes them very connected to want to be part of something else. Those are key things to understand. Now, I'm not saying you have to know whether or not your staff were latchkey kids, but this is just understanding where people come from. 
And actually, I was really glad to read this bullet when I was doing my research that it is a fusion of boomers and Generation Y. Because as I was doing research, I kept thinking, wow, I got a little baby boomer in me, and I got a little Generation Y in me. I feel like I'm in the middle. And when I finally read this somewhere, I was like, oh, good, I feel, I feel better about that. But when you think about it, every generation, those were our parents. So it's not like there was just a group of people, and then there was another group of people. These were the people that birthed the next generation. So before we get so hard on people, we created the monsters that came after us. And we're also products of those who came before us. Are there any questions? I just want to slow down for a second. So yes, I do find myself, and as I, as I kept researching more, I kept saying, OK, is that the baby boomer in me, or is that the millennial in me? OK, Generation Y. How many of you are in Generation Y? OK, good. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> you all were born between 1980 and 1999. You guys get two slides. You are more than 70 million strong, so you are all over the workforce. You're confident, you're independent, you're goal-oriented. You like to be coached and given, directed, given directions and feedback. You want to be rewarded for extra work. If you stay late, you want some money for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, and you have a desire to do meaningful work. And this is something that I wish more people understood about millennials. So, let me tell you my millennial story. At work, we started uh, an innovation team with nursing where we started doing our own lit reviews and coming up with bibliographies on different topics. So the first topic we did was innovation and disrupt disruptive innovation. And then we moved on to looking at millennials because, like I said, the majority of the workforce in my campus are baby boomers. And there's a few of us Gen Xers in there. And there's a couple of millennials coming in. And we had conversations about millennials. So the gentleman that came in to talk to us was going through all these different traits of millennials. By the time that meeting was over, I was depressed. I said, these are the people that are going to be leading us? It was like, oh my god, the millennials are coming. Please don't take offense by any of this. <laughs> but, you know, they made it sound like millennials were a bunch of snot-nosed kids who thought they ruled the world and were going to come in and try to change and take over. And I said, well, that's not going to happen on my watch. <laughs> but as I started to really do the research, and this was even before I knew I was coming here, and I started to really look and look in the literature, I started to realize this is an exciting time. Because we can find out how the generations can work together. I'd rather spend my time trying to figure out how can I um, embrace a millennial coming into the organization instead of trying to conform them to what we know the organization to be. And I'm hoping that more of my colleagues will do the same. So we're having that conversation at work and that's what made me want to talk about that today. Because I said, you know, we're having the conversation on the other generation end of how we can embrace the millennials. But who's telling the millennials how to embrace us and how to present themselves so that they're more embraceable? So I said, well, that's what I want to talk about, because I've got a captive audience of millennials right here today. And technically, you're not driven by money. Now, this is something interesting. I was at a person-centered care conference last year, last week in Boston, and they did a session on embracing generations. And one thing that I never thought of, <clears throat> you know, we talk about, oh, well, millennials, they just want to get positions, and they just want to make money, and they just want to move up the corporate ladder. But a lot of that is because you're also the generation that has the most student loan debt. So you all need to work, <laughs> and need to work fast and quickly to start paying those debts off. Whereas the previous generations didn't have as much debt. Many of you are going straight through graduate school. I don't want to scare anybody, but you've got some bills staring you in the face. So some millennials are trying to move up quick so they can pay their bills. So that's something that when I started to understand it, I'm like, oh, OK. It's not just about the money. You want to have a life outside of your work. So work-life balance is very important to you. Um, and you feel that the job should accommodate that. Um, that's, you know, we have mixed feelings about that. You're team-oriented, which is a good thing, because if you're coming into the organization, we have to make sure that we embrace you as part of the team. So yes, you do change jobs every few years for a couple of reasons, though. One, are you being embraced in the place where you are? If they don't like you and you feel like it's a not a millennial friendly place, you're going to leave. And that's okay. So I came up in the generation where you stayed at your job 40 years, you got your gold watch and then you retired. Now people are moving around and when I was growing up I remember learning you don't want to have a lot of, 
you know, short spurts on your resume. It looks like you can't keep a job. It looks like you can't stay in one place. And now I'm starting to learn that's not necessarily true. I've been at Westchester three years. I'm ready to go. And that's okay. And uh, as one of my mentors said, it's no longer a career ladder. It's a jungle gym. You're moving laterally, you're moving up maybe a little bit, but you're moving into a different department or a different discipline. Again, it's about finding your calling. And the, the hierarchical workplace, this is probably one of the difficult things that we struggle with because many of our organizations are still very hierarchical. And they feel like, well, I'm the new kid on the block, nobody ever listens to me. Informal appearance. I'm going to talk about this one for a minute. This is a little controversial. So um, at our hospital, we have a corporate space that's right near Grand Central Terminal. And we just had it, we just had it done. We moved many of our corporate uh, departments into this space. And they did one of those open space designs. So nobody has an office. Really glad I don't work down here. Um, uh, they have glass dividers, and it's very funky and new, and all this new technology, and plugging stuff in the walls. It's, it's very beautiful. Um, but they have dress codes. And I think there's three different dress codes you can choose from depending on what department you work in. So you could do business casual, Friday casual. I, I forgot what the, the jargon was. But either way, you don't have to be in a suit and tie every day. So some millennials love that. I don't, why should I have to wear a suit and tie? So I have a little bit of an issue with that that I won't bring. That's my own personal opinion, but I like seeing all of you all sitting here in your suits and your ties with a professional appearance. But those are non-patient-facing folks. Nobody's walking around looking sloppy or anything. Don't, don't get me wrong. But these are things that we have to consider. So our hospital is being looked at as very forward-thinking because we are allowing you know, millennials to have a space that they can feel comfortable in. What's also interesting is I've just read a couple of articles recently to say that open space designs are really not that, you know, they're not as great as people think they are. But that's another story. So these are some traits that I want you to pay attention to. These are the traits that make us say, oh my God, the millennials are coming. So I want you to be aware of them because they're kind of like misunderstood and misconstrued. And that's why I want us to understand that some of these are the reasons why people are maybe a little anti-millennial. So what I want you to do is I want you to prove them wrong. So they think that you have no loyalty. You keep leaving the organization every three years. Or you can't seem to sit still. But we already talked about why that happens sometimes. Um, you need guidance and instruction. But it's because you want to learn. You're asking questions because you want to be coached. You want to understand the culture of the organization. Some people look at that as they don't know how to do anything. Um, some people feel that millennials are impulsive and that they want instant gratification. That they have a low tolerance for stress. So I had a staff member who came and she wanted a yoga ball and a yoga mat in her office. And I was like, why? <laughs> She said, well, I think that's what all the millennials are doing. <laughs> no. Um, and then <laughs> many people, <clears throat> I told you, I got a little baby boomer in me. Um, and many of you can't take criticism. But maybe it's because we haven't given the feedback in a way that you all can grasp constructively. So I want you to think about some of these traits that people are seeing, and I want you to prove them wrong. Because that's not what I see when I look at you guys right here. Okay. So, being millennial friendly. So these are some of the things that we're talking about in, in our campus. About, you know, how can we embrace Generation Y? Because we know that y'all are coming. So how can we embrace it? So we want to take some of those traits that we know you have and make sure that we're prepared. So we have to be sure that we're offering coaching. What does our onboarding look like? Maybe we have to change how we onboard our staff. If we claim that millennials are not loyal and don't want to stay, how can we build loyalty? How can we get millennials to feel that they're really part of the team and want to stay? This is very important. We have to provide opportunities for collaboration. Why? Because we said that millennials like to work in teams. They also like to feel that they're part of a decision-making process. So we have to make that happen for them. Reward and recognize. Again, we said that millennials like to, to know that they did a good job. So we have to build in rewards and recognition programs. And let me just stop here for a second. 
none of these are only for millennials. <coughs> this is just good business. This is good leadership. And so we wouldn't do this, well, well the millennials that are coming in, this is what we're going to do for them. No, this is what we do for everyone. But it's, you, you're changing the framework of how you do some of these things. You know, we need to instill trust. Transparency is something that I think that the healthcare organizations are slowly starting to open up about and being more transparent. I'm very transparent um, with my team. If, if I feel like we're going to change your organization or your department, I bring you in from the very beginning and say, look, we're going to do some reorganization. Let's talk about it. I want you at the table. And finally, changing policies to fit the times. So a good example of this, I went, when I was at the conference last week, they were talking about cell phone policies. And he said, you know, we've got to change our cell phone policies. So he gave the example of a healthcare um, professional who was in a patient's room and had just taken the patient's vital signs and was on their phone, doing something on their phone. Supervisor walks by, <coughs> flips out, goes off on the person, takes a cell phone away. And the employee was trying to explain to them, I was using an app that was helping me, you know, crunch the numbers on the diagnostics or whatever. It was, they were using it as part of their, their work and taking care of the patient. And so what, what, made it, what made us think about this was, why is it that we have cell phone policies? Why do you think we have cell phone policies for no cell phone usage when you're taking care of patients? Why would you think we would have that policy? This male. HIPAA violations because they think you're going to try to take a picture of somebody. What else? I'm glad you said that because people keep forgetting about HIPAA. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, they might think that it's unprofessional if you're on your phone while you're supposed to be with patients. Absolutely. Unprofessional while you're supposed to be with the patient. And distractions, you might make a mistake if you're distracted by something on your phone. You might be distracted and make a mistake. Anybody else? Okay, so that's why we're doing it. Distractions, HIPAA violations, not paying attention to the patient. Well, what's the difference between that and a bunch of nurses and professionals standing around chit-chatting at the nurse's station while there are call bells going off? We don't have a policy about standing around the nurse's station chit-chatting while call bells are going off. So what the challenge was, was let's stop looking at the behaviors and creating policies around behaviors and start creating policies around values. So you change your policy to instead be no cell phones at the bedside to no distracting practices. It's kind of like texting and driving. They don't necessarily have a law about texting and driving. It's about distracted driving. Because, you know, it's funny. They talk about people texting, but women have been putting mascara on in the car for years. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what, you know, and it, it made me think. I'm like, you know, that's a good point. I'm going to take that back. Um, but, but that's some of the things that we need to think about, and especially with millennials, they're using apps. Why did we have cell phones in the first place? Because people were talking to each other. Or then they were texting each other. Now it's all about social media and apps and things like that, so we got really scared. And we're like, okay, we need some cell phone policies. But at the end of the day, what are we really concerned about? We're concerned about the patient and making sure that that patient is taken care of and feels taken care of and doesn't feel ignored. If I was saying to my patient, you know what, your blood pressure doesn't look good, I'm going to check this app and see what it says, that makes them feel much more comfortable than you just on your phone doing something and they don't know what you're doing. So build policies around value. So this is just a small chart. I just wanted to kind of put this together for some of the traits because if we can kind of categorize some of the things that are similar, it's how, you, it, how, it's how it helps us to determine how we can deal with the different generations. So the trait of desiring respect, that's across the board. Everybody wants that. Um, in terms of being technologically adept, that's pretty much between X and Y. So how do we combat that? Let's say you're a Gen, a Gen Yer and, and you're in a, in a facility that's a lot of baby boomers, some Gen Xers. How do you think you can combat some of the technological challenges? Put yourself in a situation, because it's going to happen. Yes, sir? Don't, like, don't be afraid to help the other coworkers in, like, a, in a nice way and not get talking down on it. Okay, don't be afraid to help your coworkers. Anybody else? So I have an employee who's, um, actually she's probably past baby boomer, and she was working on a project, and I asked uh, one of my other staff, who is a millennial, I asked her to help her out. And she said, oh, well, I could teach her how to do the programs. I was like, no, no, no. 
just just do the chart for her. Don't don't try to teach her anything. Just just do the chart for her because you have to be sensitive about that too. I love the fact that she wanted to teach her how to do something, but I was like, in this instance, just just do it for her and let her get it done because there are some people that at some at this point in their careers and she's part time, they're they're not they're not trying to learn anything. It's not that it was hindering the process. But yeah, there's a nice way of doing that, and we as, as an older generation have to learn to ask for help and say, you know what, you were, I was watching you do that. How did you do that? And I'm finding a lot of our older nurses at the campus are actually doing that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was actually at New York Presbyterian over the summer. And did you have fun? Yeah, I did. What campus were you on? Okay, I now I'm going to ask you questions. Oh, sure. <laughs> I was at the corporate office, actually. At 466 Lex? Yeah. Did the, you like the it? No office room. Yeah, I did, although I did think it was difficult to concentrate when you could hear everything. That's been the downside, I've heard. Um, but something that I appreciated that NYP was doing in the way of technology was um, integrating it more into the employee experience universally, which gave it a very... Um, an institutional backing that legitimized it. Mm -hmm. For example, um, they were developing a wayfinding app that mm -hmm. both patients and staff members could use because it's kind of confusing navigating new spaces in any hospital. And I think that um, taking that step to institutionalize the use of technology can go a long way in gaining acceptance among people. That's a good point. Thank you. And thank you for that, 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 uh, that comment. Um, it's funny you talk about wayfinding. I can remember when I first started working at the hospital, they had footsteps. <laughs> They're like, follow the blue footsteps if you were in a children's hospital. That's how you figured out how to get to the elevators. And you would always get to the point where it would just stop. Because, <laughs> you know, they had been using the footsteps and nobody knew that. Then there was the blue line on the wall. You know, follow the blue line. And, and the blue line would be peeling off at some point. And so I'm glad that we've finally gotten up on some real technology. But, you know, signage is important. You know, it's, I've learned, and it's funny, so talking about Cornell, what I didn't know was that at New York Presbyterian, because we're the only hospital in the country that is affiliated with two independent medical schools. So Cornell, Cornell Medical School and Columbia University Medical Center are totally independent of each other, but both, hosp but both, uh, both schools are affiliated with one hospital. It, it's, a, it's a very interesting marriage. Um, but what I didn't realize was, you know, every space is labeled. So at the hospital, when I, before I came to Westchester, I was at the Columbia campus. And I, didn't, I never realized that the signs on the door, if it had a red line on top, that was Cornell space. And if it had a blue line on top, it was Columbia space. And I thought that was kind of cool. But I was like, but nobody knows that. So what's the difference? It's <laughs> a little side story. That was the millennial in me. That, was, that makes no sense. Um, so yes, also showing an institutional desire to change technology. You know, we have mobile heartbeat, um, which is interesting because it's a... It's a, it's a, you can either install it on your own uh, cell phone or we have cell phones on every unit. And it's basically a communications device. It's, it's easier to communicate. We don't have to page. We don't have to do all that kind of stuff. And it's very interesting. But then we had to look at our cell phone policy. Well, how can we institute mobile heartbeat and have the nurses have cell phones on the unit if we're not supposed to have cell phones on the unit? <laughs> and that's when you have to start thinking, okay, let's stop thinking about the behavior and think about the value of it. Um, what's the next one? The desire to champion social and environmental causes. I like this one because if you think about it, why do you think baby boomers and Gen Y would both have this in common? Think about the times in which they grew up. Yes, ma'am. I think the baby boomers were our age in like the 60s, if, that, if I'm getting that about right. So that's a time ripe with protests and social change and lots of action. A lot of their parents were at Woodstock. They were involved with the anti-war war demonstrations. Remember, every generation influences the next. So you may not have experienced something directly, but you saw what your parents experienced. And then in Gen Y, you know, you, now that you, we have all these news outlets, we're seeing what's going on in other countries. You know, we're, we're very green and, and, and all those other things. Whereas in my generation, you know, we had a lot of the fiscal crises were going on. Not so much social causes. But think about what Generation Y, they're growing up in 
They're growing up in Sandy. They're growing up with all of these, you know. It's, it's not just about the times in which you lived. It's about, let's see how to frame this. It's about when you started to really think about the world. So it's not so much that you were born in 1964, but when you got to be of age where you understood the world around you, that's what really influenced you. So if you were born in 64, your, your years of influence really started like when you turned 12, 13, 14, things like that. So that's how you also have to, have to frame it. So a lot of generation wise, like what, what were you all doing on 9-11? Somebody tell me, what were you doing on 9-11? I was in my third grade class. We looked right out on the Hudson River. We were 20 miles north of uh, Manhattan and Westchester. So third grade. Yep. Anybody else? What were you? Um, second grade. Watching. Uh, <laughs> you know what? We're going to move on. I can't. <laughs> that was a bad move. <laughs> no, you were in the second grade. Yeah, just watching on the news and thinking it was just. Um, I didn't think it was real at first. I didn't really didn't understand the extent of it, but it was great. Uh, well, you were in kindergarten, right? I was in kindergarten. <laughs> I was actually in kindergarten. This <laughs> 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 is joking. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was in kindergarten, and we actually, I was in Connecticut, and we had to evacuate our school because we were so close to everything that was going on. Yeah. So I, what, what shocked me, <laughs> because we were talking about it a couple weeks ago, and my assistant, who is a millennial, but I guess she's an older millennial, she was in high school. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, wait a minute, they're talking about elementary school. Okay, so that didn't go as well as I expected it to. Um, but, you know, yeah, you, so, so your, your influences are a, little, are a little different. I actually was working up at Milstein, um, up at Columbia, and um, my sister worked at JFK, and she called me at work and said, did you hear what happened? And I said, no. She said, a plane flew into the Twin Towers. I'm like... So I turned, I could still access the news, and I was watching CNN on the, on the computer. And as I turned to it, it was when the second tower was hit. And the first thing I remembered was, all of a sudden, Manhattan seemed like a very small island to me. And even though I was way uptown by the George Washington Bridge, all I kept thinking about was, I need to get off this island. I started to feel very claustrophobic. And I, I talked to my boss, she's like, you know, go home while you can, we're good, the staffing is good, blah, blah, blah. I was doing budgets then, they, you know, so she's like, go home. And it took me six hours to drive home that day for an hour drive. But a lot of things that happen in your lifetime will influence how you make decisions going forward. So that's why these two have in common. The desire to form friendly, collaborative, some people think the millennials are not friendly. But I think you are. But we have to show ourselves friendly. As older people, well, not older people, but older generations, I was telling my, I was telling my kids, like, oh, mommy's getting old. And my son gets really mad at me. He said, "You're not old." I said, "I didn't say I was old. I said I was getting old." There's <laughs> a difference, little boy. <laughs> now these last, <laughs> these last three, um, I, I like these because recognition. Everybody has it, but it just comes in a different form. So again, baby boomers, you could just say thank you, and they're good with that. Um, but Generation X and Y, we need a little bit more than a thank you. So I have my staff and my team, I ask my staff, how do you like to be recognized? We have a very robust recognition program. In our employee engagement survey, we also struggle with uh, recognition. Because the question asks, have you been recognized in the last seven days? And we always get weird answers. So one of my staff said to me, you know, <clears throat> one of my employees, had talked about how she just took the employee engagement survey and she answered that question no, that she had not been recognized in the last seven days. And my employee said, but we were just in a staff meeting last week and we talked about what a wonderful job she did with XYZ Project. She couldn't understand why she would have answered the question that way. But it's because that staff member looked at recognition as we have a platform called OC Tanner which is where you can send e-cards, you can send awards, you know, you can have different ways of, of recognizing staff. Sometimes it's tangible, they can get points that can add up to, you know, gift cards and things like that. It's actually kind of cool. Or you could just send a card to somebody to thank them for a job well done. That's what she saw as recognition. She didn't see a thank you as recognition. So be cautious as to how people are viewing recognized and ask people how they like to be recognized. 
work hours. I like this one too. So because the baby boomers had that strong work ethic, they, they, they'll work forever. They'll work 12 hours a day. But some people always say, well, they're real hard working. But I challenge that. They're long working. There's a difference. They, they can do a lot in 12 hours, but there's a lot of people who could do the same amount of work in less than 12. Because baby boomers can chit chat and you know, do all kinds of other stuff. So, so, so millennials and Generation Xers are more concerned with the value of their time and how they make use of their time. Whoops. And how they make use of their time. And finally, loyalty. I like this one too. You will hear a baby boomer say, I have worked for New York Hospital for 40 years. You will hear a Generation X person said, I've been a healthcare administrator at various organizations for 40 years. They're loyal to their craft, what their role is. I, I am blessed to be an, a health care administrator. Yes, I've been at the same hospital for 26 years, but I've been in different roles and different, um, different places, but I have been a health care administrator. And millennials just want to be who they are. They want to be able to say, I championed social causes, I had my work-life balance, oh yeah, and I worked at New York Presbyterian. I did that too. So it doesn't sound as selfish as it does on the screen, but, but that's where the loyalty is. So it's not about company loyalty anymore. And those are the kind of things that we need to really think about. Oh, I had a question about that. Oh, yes. Uh, so for Generation Xers, uh, to what extent are they technology adept in terms of uh, engaging with apps and softwares to uh, streamline long or tedious tasks? I think it depends. So remember, these are generalizations, and it has to do with how you grew up. I have colleagues who are my age who didn't have a computer or didn't do computer classes. So they may not be as computer savvy. I don't consider myself extremely computer savvy. I can't create an app, but I know how to use most of them. You know, when the IT guy comes to my office, I watch to see what he's doing so that I can know how to fix it the next time. So it all depends on the individual, but I think that there are not a Gen Xers out there who support the mission of using technology to do, to do things better. I, I, I want to make a point to, to, to segue into that. I think Generation X is really crucial in this time period. Because we have that kind of duality between baby boomers and Gen Y, I think that we can help facilitate a lot of this bridging the gap between the generations. And that's a perfect example. You know, I support new technology. So when, when the hospital wants to do some new wayfinding program, some of the baby boomers, you know, they're like, yeah, well, we're doing this. You know, we got to do it. But whereas me, I'd be like, okay, I'm embracing it and helping the millennials to embrace it and helping the baby boomers to embrace it. So, so we're kind of a little bit of a, of a change agent um, between the generations. Was that answer? Yeah, thank you. Yes, ma'am. How do you think the... Uh, sort of dissolution of pension plans impacts the loyalty to one organization over your career? Well, so that's a good question. How does the dissolution of pension plans, to, you know, talk about loyalty to an organization? This is a good point. So we found out this past week, we have, New York Presbyterian has used Blue Cross Blue Shield for as long as I've been there and before. And I read on the Infonet the other day that we're switching to Aetna. I was like, ah! <laughs> and I was talking with a, a young lady um, at the hospital, and we were, I was telling, we have very long tenure at my campus, and this year it seems like a lot of people are finally retiring and things like that. And she said a lot of people are getting tired. They're getting tired of the changes, and they don't want to be part of them anymore. So a lot of people may be leaving because the health insurance is different. You know what? I need to come out of it now. I just need to stop working now. So even the loyal people because of changing pension plans and things like that, are choosing to not be as loyal to the organization. I don't know how millennials feel about pensions. Because in most organizations, you have to be there five years to get vested. What I would believe, and this is just my personal thought based on what I've been researching, is that most millennials are financially savvy enough where they're not dependent upon a hospital or an organizational pension plan, they're doing their own personal investing. So they're putting their trust in the bank and, and, the, and the stock market. That's just my opinion. Does that answer your question? But yeah, benefits have a lot to do with loyalty. 
um, to get you in the door. But pension is a totally different thing. Because like I said, you know, I remember when I got vested, I was, it was like a big celebration. I was like, I'm vested, I'm vested. And we would joke with people when they would hit their five-year mark, I'd say, you're vested, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> but now that's not, that's not necessarily true. So that's why if I know I'm not going to stay someplace for five years, I need to figure out what I am going to do about my pension plan. So you all might want to start thinking about that.